Okay, so thanks for thanks for coming back. Uh, our next speaker is the distinguished Mattia Shukla, sometimes known as Hook. Yes. And uh, he's going to talk about the um, fiduciary license agreement, a very interesting and innovative um, uh, contributor agreement that FSF Europe developed. And I will turn it over to him. Um, hello, my name is Matthias Schukle, um, and I work for the Free Software Foundation Europe. Uh, more specifically, I'm leading the legal team. Um, I hope that the VGA jack stays where it is. It's a bit flimsy. Um, and I'm going to talk about a fiduciary license agreement. Um, and we're going to start with a short introduction what it actually is and what it does. And continue with analyzing. Could you speak up? Speak up. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So um, we're going to start with the talk. I'm going to start the talk with a short introduction what the FLA actually does. Um, and then continue using four use cases to show what the lessons are that we learned in the past uh, six, seven years that we've been using it. And later on, continue uh, with um, where we want to take the FLA in the future. So, starting off with um, what the FLA actually is, um, and this is the dev room for the legal talks, so I think I can shorten it up very easily to say this is a contributor, uh, this is a um, copyright assignment um, that is written specifically with uh, with the communities, with the free software project and free software communities in mind. So it does, it's not written to benefit um, the legal entity who gains the copyright, but it's there to make sure that the software stays free software. Um, even if the, for example, if the um, entity would go batshit crazy someday, uh, someday later on. So, um, of course, as any uh, copyright assignment, it does have the benefit of gathering all the copyright into one place, which means it's a lot easier to manage the licensing. Uh, it's easy to relicense if you have to, so you want to update the license. Um, although it does include a clause that says that it has to stay free software always, so the project is not able to just derail and become uh, proprietary. Um, because the legal entity that got the copyright assigned went crazy. Um, it also provides some other um, rules that um, make sure that, um, that the fiduciary, which is the, entity, uh, the legal entity, um, continues with keeping it free software. So, for example, I mean, one of some of the examples were that we already seen uh, with FLA um, helping is if somebody stops contributing, you know how it is. I mean, you get a life, you get kids, you I don't know, you get you become unemployed or you become too employed, you get hit by a bus. Complicated stuff. It complicates copyright design a lot. But I mean, copyright uh, managing a lot. If you're not, if the person who wrote the code is not able to uh, say yes or no to uh, um, license change in their own work. So, for example, if you got stuck, if you wrote a piece of code in GPL v1, get hit by a bus, and now not only does the project want to use GPL v2, but maybe use GPL v3 or whatever, uh, and it's incompatible, they're not able to use your code anymore. So. For such uh, reasons, and also for uh, for helping with violations, because um, an entity with exclusive rights on the whole code base has a lot bigger leverage than um, than just a single um, developer who got sued by usually a company or something. Um, it does make sense to sign the FLA, or yeah, that's any copyright assignment, but as I'm going to explain, the FLA does things in a way that makes sure that you are also protected from the entity, not just by the entity. Um, so how does the FLA work in a nutshell? I'm going to explain it in plain words because this is a lightning talk, um, but for, you know, for an overview, refer to this picture, 
and for and for uh, legal subtitles refer to the um, as usual the tiny text hidden somewhere in the picture. So in a nutshell, um, the beneficiary that is how the document calls the awesome developer assigns full copyright to the fiduciary, which is the um, which is the entity um, uh, which makes sure which makes um, sure that the copyright. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry. The fiduciary is the entity, or it can also be an individual who holds ultimately the copyright from the whole project and uh, is um, facilitating that copyright and making sure everything runs fine when it comes to copyright. It's not necessarily the same organization that um, manages the everyday uh, work of the project but it's advisable if it is because they at least know the projects and uh, the project a lot better and also know the developers themselves <coughs> okay so now the fiduciary has all the copyright but assigns basically a non-exclusive version of the same back to the developer so the end result is uh, plus an additional uh, license to a non additional non-exclusive license to make sure that the developer can really use their own work in any way they want. So they can the developer can then realize uh, license their own work um, under any license they want to anybody they want. So including if for some reason you need to uh, as part of a proprietary project. Um, on the other hand, the fiduciary not only is allowed to only um, offer it under a free software license, but according to the document is also required to publish it as free software. So, as you can see, there are some carefully selected checks and balances that make sure that the project stays free software. And uh, one of the biggest uh, checks and balances comes already from the name of the document, the fiduciary licensing agreement, fiduciary meaning trust, uh, which mean, uh, it means that if the trust uh, by the beneficiaries into the, that they invest into the fiduciary is broken, um, the FLA terminates automatically and all, the, and all the rights flow back to the fiduciaries, so to the developers. And from the um, uh, from the fiduciary, which means that the entity now has no copyright in the thing. So I'll continue with the four use cases and start with the smallest one, um, which is Ionic. Um, you maybe you've heard of it, probably not. It's um, UML-based SDK to write uh, Python code. So from what I understand, you actually use UML to program and Python code automatically comes out. I um, haven't tested it yet. So the project started in 2007 as a proprietary solution. And in 2009, they assigned, all the, pro all the developers assigned their copyright using the FLA to the FSFE and uh, released the code under the GPL v2. <coughs> um, Nothing major happened since then uh, in terms of legal stuff. Um, <clears throat> but in 2014, um, when I got um, in touch again with the main developer and the maintainer of the project, uh, he said that they're, uh, they're, they're starting again uh, after, I don't know, a year or two of uh, dormant phase and they're thinking of upgrading the license to something newer, maybe even to AGPL. Um, so the next one is Bacula, which is a fairly bigger project with around 60 developers. <coughs> and um, with Bacula, the thing is that it started in 2000 as a proprietary um, enterprise-ready backup solution, and in 2002 they released the code under the GPL v2 and the documentation under the FDL. In 2006 they assigned all the copyrights um, using, um, using the FLA to FSFE, 
and we signed a memorandum of understanding regarding licensing. Um, but things started complicating around 2008 where the main developer and uh, still current maintainer um, started gathering copyright assignments from the developers themselves which, in which included also the right to um, release the code under a proprietary version. So in terms of code what happened is that now there was a community version which was HEBL v3 and a proprietary enterprise version which included some additional plugins. Um, in terms of legal stuff um, it means that we suddenly had like this one group of developers who assigned their copyright to FSFE and another group of developers who assigned uh, their copyright to Kern Sibold and an overlap of the two which obviously caused massive chaos. Um, so in 2003, uh, 2013 we sat down and uh, discussed it like uh, adults and um, <coughs> because part of the code um, copyright flows flows kind of like from the the developers over the using the FLA directly to the FSFE, but the other one flows from the developers using the copyright assignment to Kern Sibold, but because Kern Sibold signed the original FLA to the FSFE um, and the clause is included, um, that same code also flows from the FLA, um, copyright of the code also flows using the, the Kern's FLA with the FSFE back into the uh, FSFE. But because you have this first, we cannot, we cannot um, stop um, the code being used in a proprietary environment because well the developers have agreed with it and as we saw in the second or third slide um, that's explicitly allowed with the FLA and it makes sense um, but what we did is we sat down and we discussed the whole issue um, and what we agreed upon is that um, all the features that are um, in the um, Enterprise Edition have to flow in due time back into the, um, and into the community version, so they have to pop up into the uh, free software version um, in a few years. The same goes for patches, obviously, and um, they will start reporting how much, how much they um, uh, contributed to the free software version. And there's also some checks and balances to make sure that if um, that the code gets um, of the enterprise edition uh, gets under the copyright of FSFE in case uh, uh, Bacula Systems uh, stops distri uh, distributing the uh, enterprise version, or if it's the, or if the um, they stop contributing to the free software version, or the company goes belly up, or whatever. Um, there's also a trademark clause. We also get the trademark along with the code um, if the company goes belly up. Um, so that way we kind of made a proprietary project which was a open core project later on into um, something that's still has some proprietary bits, but ultimately all the proprietary bits are going to be open source because there is an agreement about it, um, including some um, including damages. So it's it's not just something we sign because we don't have anything else to do. Um, the next case is KDE, and um, this is a really huge thing, not just because. Um, the project is humongous with um, developers from all over the world and a huge code base but also because um, because of the fact and the fact that they, the first version of uh, KDE was uh, um, released 10 years before they joined the FLA they had this huge number of contributors and this huge um, code base and documentation obviously that um, you know, requiring suddenly that everybody should sign the FLA would be a tremendous 
uh, effort. And they figured out that's not the way they want to go because it's too much work. Uh, and what they do is that they recommend, really warmly recommend the developers to sign the FLA but don't force them to. And apparently it works really well for them. More and more developers mostly and most of the core developers have signed it. Um, it's also different that they don't use the vanilla version of the FLA, but they w we work together with the KDEV, uh, which is the uh, NGO that handles um, the community of KDE, to uh, modify the FLA to suit them a bit better and also to change the fiduciary to point to KDEV. Um, <coughs> as part of the modification is also the FERP, which is the fiduciary relicensing policy, uh, which is a document that a uh, separate document that says um, under which licenses each kind of contribution must be licensed. So you have like I don't know. It says if it's a library, it can be licensed under the LGPL V21 or blah or something. So you have like groups. <laughs> of um, contributions and groups of uh, acceptable licenses for them. Um, it also includes a procedure that the KDEV has to take if they want to relicense a piece of code. So even if a developer has assigned their copyright to KDEV, they still have to follow those rules. And um, it's a very stable doc. Um, it's in fact, it's so stable that you have to, the KDEV, in order to change the relicensing policy, um, has to have a, a vote with the same majority as if they would change their own constitution. So another project we, that uses the FLA is um, a EU-funded educational project uh, that is about free software and open standards. Um, the SELF project started um, in 2000-something um, and it ended in 2009 because um, and part of the consortium or uh, part of the self consortium is also FSFE and since it start stopped in 2009 um, there's nothing new to say about it sorry okay um, so what we learned from all this is that the FLA does in fact make uh, projects lives easier um, and it's also, if you explain it well enough to the developers, uh, it's well accepted by the developers and they like to sign it if they understand it. Which also means that we learned that it's very efficient, that, I mean, legal text, even if they're nicely worded, um, like I think the FLA is, um, it's still, geeks are still going to f try and find bugs in it. I mean, that's what we do. So what you have to do, you have to prepare for that because, and, and the best thing is to do that is in person, like uh, have talks at conferences, have BOF sessions like the KDE people do, etc. So you can, you know, discuss in person um, what they what their fears are and figure out if there actually is a bug or there isn't. Um, so what we also learned is that it is an over administrative overhead, but. That's kind of to be expected when you're handling copyright of other people, right? Um, it's also, as an example of KDE, the fiduciary relicensing policy and having a patch policy um, are a very good idea to have. And uh, we're actually thinking of maybe incorporating that into the FLA as well, um, into the vanilla version. So what do we want to do with the FLA in the future? Um, we want to make it more user friendly because honestly the form you have to fill out, the user interface is not very transparent. Um, we want to make that one clearer so you don't have to always explain to people what does each box mean. Um, but I, I'm exaggerating that people understand it, it's just, I want it to be clearer. Um, there's also, the wording is really good, but um, we have found some you know, minor uh, modifications that we want to do, and uh, although the text is already tried and tested, and um, I think in Germany, and it was also written in mind to 
be legal in both in uh, continent and uh, civil as well as common law uh, jurisdictions <coughs> when we you when we are use, uh, talking to huge projects like KD we figure out there's like uh, could be some issues within India so we're also trying to make sure that it works in the Asia as well and uh, we also want to tackle new um, problems that we didn't anticipate back then like patents and trademarks and basically whatever the community needs it which also means that I'm open for questions and ideas. Pam? Um, what, what happens with respect to enforcement of the copyright? So I turn over my copyright to the fiduciary. Does the fiduciary have any obligation to go after wrongdoers that might be offending you know, my choices or, the, or open source licensing? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the text actually has an explicit clause about that, but it is implied at least that if you complain and say somebody is uh, violating my copyright or somebody sued me uh, and you own the copyright, I mean, first of all, if somebody sued the individual developer and the exclusive rights are at, the, at uh, some organization, um, the first thing you do is just, hey, <laughs> exclusive rights, go ask them, not me. I just have a license. Um, the other thing is, um, I think if the, <coughs> the fiduciary would not go after this and they wouldn't respond, if it turns out badly, it could be considered a breach of trust. So the FLA would just void and you would get uh, your copyright back. So, uh, so I, I missed a logical step that I'd like to get clarification on the back of the situation. You said that you couldn't prevent the originator, the, the one guy uh, who did most of the back of the stuff, to proprietarize because he had all those copyright assignments. Mm -hmm. But that would th th there's an assumption there that it means that he collected, he must have collected copyright assignments from everyone who ever signed an FLA for that to be true. Is that what happened? As what we understand, that is true. So it, 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 how did that happen politically? I'm curious. Um, like, like, it, it, he convinced everybody that ever signed an agreement with you to go sign an agreement with him? That's from uh, what we understand, that's the case, yeah. Um, but I agree, it's complicated. If, if that's not the case, we'll see what happens. But um, that's, what, that's what, uh, what the situation that we understand is at the moment. Um, the thing also is that when you mentioned the logical step, um, Kern is also the owner of Bacula Systems, which is the company that does the proprietary version and is the company that already had employed most of the developers for Bacula in the past as well. Mr. Zach? Yeah, so trying to prove your point that geeks try to, you know, nitpick on the legal text. So I noticed that. It, it, I, and I, I just read the, uh, the uh, FLA. I agree with you; it's very, very well written, first class. But there is a, a sentence which is kind of weird. In the event FSFE violates the principles of free software, so do you think that's kind of enforceable? In, in I, I, sense? yeah, that's that's a question we have. We got a lot. But um, what are you going to do? I mean, the, the legal. I mean, that's always the question <laughs> between um, natural and. Um, Humanitarian sciences. I mean, especially when we're talking about um, the world of is versus the world of should, uh, which is the legal world. Um, so yes, it is a vague term, the term. But I think that if we're talking about free software, we're talking about well, we're talking about something that quite a few NGOs agree upon, and those NGOs are considered to be the the interpreter of what free software is, um, but yes, it's not it's not very explicit what it says. But then again, if it was very explicit, we'd have to update it every time a new thread came, and then you can have like a really verbose text, and that's even easier to to find. Or if you have a really verbose text, it's even easier to find loopholes in it because it's, it doesn't say explicitly that. And you come in if you have like you know a definition of five pages long. It's kind of weird to say yes, but that was implied. Thanks. So it was back there. I, I think the gentleman at the back was first. How does the FLA compare to um, FSF? Right um, haven't 
invested much time in the FSF copyright assignment, but from what I understand, and um, Bradley, correct me if I'm wrong, the FSF copyright assignment is well, is intended for the GNU project um, and group project only. And the FLA, uh, what we're trying to do with the FLA is not gather copyright of other people, but we're actually making this um, <coughs> document for also other organizations to use. And we, especially if you have a foundation that already handles um, the manager, uh, manages the, that project, it makes a lot of sense to use it to assign your copyright to that foundation, not to FSFE, FSF, or anybody else, or to some or, or to some NGO that is expert in handling copyright of uh, uh, free software projects. Mm -hmm. FSFE, because hopefully they would have a good idea about what keeping up to date with what free software might, uh, the community might uh, need entail, given sort of the nebulous language that's used to provide this legal um, tool inside it. Right. So what do you think about assigning copyright to some other NGO that uses free software, but maybe is trying to have some other goal that in the future could conflict with what free software entails? But that's, uh, as I said, I mean, the FLA has uh, some checks and balances in case the fiduciary, so the, the entity you assign your copyright to, um, starts violating the basic rights of uh, free software. So, I think, that, uh, does that answer your question? I, I think so. I mean, it just it makes, it sounds like you're saying that it's, it, would be, it could be dangerous to assign your copyright to an organization like that because at that point, you, there's more of a chance that the FLA might revert, at which point it sounds like you would have to go back to the community and renegotiate because the agreement had fallen apart. Is that correct? Because um, if the FLA falls apart, it sounds like you need to re renegotiate with people. Yeah, but at least with that person who is FLA uh, terminated. Um, but I, I'll, I'd have to look into that. I think um, we're out of time, uh, unfortunately. But thank you so much for...